welcome to Parlor Tricking with TD Madia. Of course, my name is TD. This is episode 10 of a politics podcast brought to you by Eyewitness News. So last week we spoke to former President Abumbeki in Conakry. I'm continuing a little bit with that theme. I speak this week to Simpiwe Dana, also in Conakry. We caught up with a beachside, seaside, you can maybe hear bits of the ocean in the background, spoke a little bit about why she was selected to go to Conakry, the music she put together, the tribute to my Miriam Makeb, and of course, we also spoke about her own thoughts on the state of South African politics. It's been an interesting week, so um, Tina Jomat peterson who joined us a few months ago, uh, passed on and it's very interesting because I've reflected back on our conversation uh, in this season of the podcast and it was interesting because it suddenly feels so ominous it suddenly feels like she kind of sort of knew what was coming there's lots of speculation about what it is because it also happens at a time where she's facing fresh allegations of corruption bribery if you may this is in relation to the section 194 inquiry into public protector uh, so it's quite a murky picture that's playing itself out but i've also heard from people that look um, Tina Jomat suffered from a lot of depression. Um, she wasn't okay. And a part of me, when I think back to that interview we had in March, I really think something was a little bit off. The sense of urgency in needing to speak or say her piece now suddenly makes sense. And I suppose that's the thing about life. You understand things a little bit better in hindsight. And then the question marks around the controversies, because she was a complex figure, had a lot of controversies, lots of allegations. And the difficulty when life ends, particularly one like this, is that those question marks remain. They never really get answered. You don't hold people accountable. You don't test uh, the theories. And that's kind of what I think she's left us with. Um, when you look at Joburg, uh, Mayor Kabelo Kwamanda, I just think it's one more thing to note, Mayor Kabelo Kwamanda delivered his maiden speech this week. Um, he giggled his way through his maiden speech. It is what it is. Uh, but he had been MIA. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't, yeah. I don't get what's going on there, but I think it's a picture we need to keep watching. And hopefully one of these days we'll bring him on. But here's that conversation with Simpio Adana. So Simpio, thank you so much for making time to speak to us. You are in Conakry, and it's actually quite a big deal because you are here to celebrate Uma Mire Makeba. That's a big <laughs> deal itself. But also, when the Tabumbeki lecture, which is really, I think, a massive project beyond, it'll go beyond his lifetime. It finally goes beyond South Africa's borders, and you are the musical accompaniment in essence towards sending that vision to the continent. What has that process been like for you in your head? When I first got the call, and I was told what would be expected of me um, because usually I'm just called to come and perform and this time I was called and I was told that you have to create a set list of Miriam Makeba's work do the direction etc etc and it's something that I've never done before um, Miriam Makeba is a huge influence in my life in my work in my activism um, she's one of those people that I wish they were my grandmother. I could have sat at her feet and, and learned everything that she knows. And her legacy is so huge, not just for South Africa, but for the whole continent. She really, one woman stood up and said, I will speak for my people. Went all the way to the UN to speak at a time when it could have gotten her killed, uh, when she was banned for it. She couldn't come back to even bury her own mother. Um, she made all of those sacrifices. So I'm in awe of what pushed her, what drove her. And then on top of all of that, such an immense talent. She was so much more than just the talent. But then imagine someone who has such fortitude and such passion for justice to also, on top of it all, be an amazing talent, one of the best we've ever had. I started listening to her music from her uh, Miriam in the Skylarks days, and then the Manhattan Brothers as well. She did some work with the Manhattan Brothers, and she had a way of interpreting the musical influences that um, 
you know, um, she had grown up with. And that way of interpreting that music was uniquely South African. She was one of the first to create a uniquely South African sound that borrowed from other cultures. So to, to be chosen as the one person to come back to a place where she had such a huge impact um, as not just only a musician, but also as an activist. I mean, Sako Ture was the president at the time. And because of her activism and her passion for the continent, they became pretty close. And the, the amount of work that then she was able to do for the people of, of, of Guinea, particularly Dalaba, where, where she, she stayed for more, a decade, at least a decade, um, the amount of change that she brought into that society, till this day, her home still stands as a museum. The, her bodyguard at the time has kept her home has preserved her home so people can come and see how she lived because of the immense um, impact that she had on his life and um, on the life of the people of that region. What's it been like walking in the footsteps, you know? You might not have had the chance to go where she lived, but you are experiencing people she experienced. You are experiencing musicians she's influenced. What, what's that been like for you? You know, at rehearsals, we're working with a lady um, who sings pata pata like she knows our language, you know, and even the antics, she has them down pat, like how Miriam Makeba um, sang the song. And then there's a song that she sang, I think it, I believe it's called Lagini. She also sings that song for the show that we will, we will have here. And she knows the music. And wherever you go here in Guinea, you hear Malaika. Malaika is being sung everywhere that you go. That tells you of, of, of someone's impact. It reminds me, when I was in Mali, everywhere I went, Salif Keita's music was playing. You know, she, Miriam Makeba has had the same impact outside of her own country. I think that's truly amazing. And just also on a personal level, because you are somebody who is known to have political views, who cares about how we understand ourselves as a people. When you look at who and where we are as a people at the moment, what are we in need of? What do you think that's the one thing that could happen that could galvanize us in a different direction, in a better direction from where you stand? I feel quite jaded, to be quite honest, um, with all the shenanigans happening in South Africa. And I feel like we're at a point where it's the middle class that are gonna to have to revolt. I believe that we could have faster change if the middle class would leave their comforts and take to the streets. That's, that's what I believe possibly could create change. Um, how did you get there? When you look at our country, you feel jaded. Again, I struggle with the fact that you are one of the musical voices, musical, one of the artists in our country who's wanted to have a voice and who's used it in the past. How did you get to the point where you're changing? What is it that you saw that led you to believe actually this is not it? Um, I think there has just been a lot of a deliberate misconstruing of the realities on the ground. As if people are protecting one thing or another. We can see the country is, is crumbling, but how is being put out there? It feels like there are just people with different interests that are trying to, uh, who are trying to protect those interests and therefore they paint a different picture than what we see on the ground. And that has made me feel quite jaded because um, for a really long time I thought that we all wanted South Africa to succeed. That, you know, even when we fight, the fight is because we all believe that the country can be better but we just have got different ways of getting there. So now I just feel like there, there is a deliberate misconstruing from certain sectors that I don't have to mention. Yes, I mean, even just ordinary people, like politics should not trump patriotism. They should not trump. When something is not working, it's not working. South Africa should come first at all times. 
such a difficult thing. I want to unpack that. Would you ever leave South Africa? For my career, yes. I, I do have an intention of, of, of leaving and going to Europe. But I want to straddle both continents because I, I cannot live without South Africa. Um, there's, there's nowhere else like my own country. But for my career, I want to, I want to make that move, yes. When you say you should go to South Africa first, that's a complex statement. And I'm sure you understand why. Mm -hmm. You have vigilante groups that have come out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. Groups that, are, that strongly feel that it is, and it's not about everybody, it is particularly aimed at African migrants living in the country. Mm -hmm. I always say it's not about Africans in South Africa where they belong. Mm -hmm. It's actually about misgovernance in essence. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people then use the phrase put South Africa first mm -hmm. um, as a way to push out fellow Africans from South Africa. Mm -hmm. Just to unpack your statement to yes. understand it. Okay. No, no, I get it. So I was um, speaking on the different political parties. I was speaking specifically about South Africans and how we are dealing with the issue of mis the, the mishandling apart of, of of governance. Mm, falling apart yes, of and and how we can even when we see we have political corners, you know, where like we can't tell the truth because we want this party to succeed. The narrow-minded view of a party yes. is yes. precedence over the needs. I understand you. Yes. You and and on the issue of, of the of, of illegal migrants, you're very right that the big issue is is, is governance. Is governance. Uh, and I feel like the people that are frustrated, you know, because there are some who are frustrated and then there are some who are, you know, riding the, the boat because they are, you know, um, Afrophobic, right? They should be dealing with government, but they're just dealing with what is right there next to them, what is accessible to them, right? The immediate and, frustration. Yes, the immediate frustration. And their frustrations should be directed at government, right? But we can't, you know, um, minimize the experience of living in a failing government that then exposes them to um, situations, you know, that impact their lives. That's very true. You don't tweet anymore. I saw you at the airport. And I said, you don't tweet anymore. <laughs> I never see your tweets. I used to know you to be somebody with very strong views, and I would see them on my social media. Yes, you know, um, I've always had this thing of saving people. Like, I, I believe I've got a savior complex. And it comes from childhood, you know, being the eldest and being a parentified child, having to take care of everyone, making sure that everyone is okay, you know. Um, and in doing that, neglecting myself, you know, never having to think of me. But, you know, how to make sure that this one is comfortable, that one is comfortable, you know. And I think as a result, and, and also the um, fact that I grew up quite poor. Um, and when you're poor, you experience a lot of negativity, right? And that had the impact of making me an empath. Because usually the pain that you feel, I've felt before. So I can empathize. I empathize quite easily. And I have this thing of saving, saving. We all think we're martyrs. Yeah. <laughs> God always says we're martyrs are dead. See, we're martyrs are dead. You know, and, and I just got to a point where I felt like, I think I've done my part when it comes to that. Because you know the negativity that comes with social I'm media. I'm yeah. on Twitter, I'm yeah. on every day. It's yeah. a really toxic, ugly it's, it's, space. And I truth. think it's become worse. It's worse. Also. It's worse than the gutter. Yeah, yeah it, I, I think it's become worse. So, um, all the name calling, because this one is protecting this situation, this political party or, or patriarchy or this or this or that, like the name calling, particularly towards black women. Women, yes, but black women, black like women they, they really get the yeah, worst of lovers. it, you, you know. We are the easy targets, you have seen Yes, that, yeah. and you get called names that you never thought you would, you would get called. And, you know, and even like regarding how you grew up, you know, you've never heard pe people being called those names. And then, you know, some 
nameless strangers on the internet like they you know so it just got to a point where even in therapy you know um, it came out that who takes care of you when do you take care of yourself and I realized that you know I, I have given myself away you know I have not left a space for myself and I decided that there are other ways to continue having this savior complex that I have, <laughs> you know, without putting my own mental health in jeopardy. And then I've also find, and I've seen it before, where they try and peg you against other local artists, mm -hmm. as if we can only have one successful female, well, one successful woman singer, mm -hmm. um, one successful conscious artist. What do you then make of that? I, I, I often. And I don't know if it is because it's easy to attack black women. I don't know if it's because people are that narrow-minded that actually in your world, in your head, there's no room for more of us to be here, all with views. What do you make that? I've seen them do that with somebody like Tani Thomas Rye with you, where, geez, we can't celebrate you both. Mm. It's got to be one or the other. When that happens, what goes through your head? The thing is, we are so different, Tani Soa and I. We are completely different. Our sound is different. Um, the only thing that does connect us is that we are very pro-Africa, right? But our sound is completely different. Our style is completely different. Um, and, you know, our writing styles even, like, very, very different. Um, I don't know, but I mean, generally, people like pitting women against each other. It's a thing, you know, and it even affected us at some point, like her and I, but we find now. I love to hear that. No, you're very good. I love you good. both yeah. really deeply. I think you're both important. Yeah, yeah. Of course, I love hearing that. Yeah. Um, I know you spoke about therapy. If I can ask, is therapy a thing that you're exploring now? Or is it something that you've been exploring for years? Is that a new thing to you? I, and I ask this because I'm in the middle of a battle. And I actually said it to you the other night. I mm -hmm. said, I'm trying to find a fit. I'm looking for a therapist that I feel is well matched to me so I can deal with my own traumas and my own issues. I'm not there yet. Mm -hmm. Um. And so it's something that I still have to try and navigate. Um, has, is, that some, is it an art that you've always known is there for you to use? Or is this a new space for you where you're trying to find yourself? It's a new space. For the longest time, I believed that I could self-heal. Like I was Martha. strong enough, yeah, you yeah. know, I would get through it. Um, but time has taught me that I was lying to myself. Um, I come from a family that is plagued by depression and anxiety. It's like, it's in our DNA. And it's honestly, it's not something that you can just sleep off, which I try to do a lot for many, many years. And just sleep, you're gonna wake up tomorrow feeling better. Just be strong, just get through it. You know, you're strong. And I would even praise myself for being strong. I know I've, got, I've, I've suffered the worst pain and look at me, I'm still standing. No, 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 don't be stoic. Don't be stoic about mental health um, because you can have a much better quality of life if you tackle that, you know. Um, could be environmental, um, your depression and anxiety and other mental health issues. It could be chemical, it could be both. Uh, I mean, a lot of us grew up in very unhealthy um, environments, you know, um, because of our past in South Africa. You know, every young black girl has a story. You know, every young black boy has a story. Um, and, and then there's just the issue of the fact that you could just have a chemical imbalance, you know. Um, it's a sickness like any other. You can't just ignore it. If you ignore it, it's going to come out in very toxic ways. And with all of that that you're carrying, are you still able to write music and heal us through your music and inspire us through your music? How has all of this affected your process where you're feeling jaded, you're also trying to heal yourself and to figure out who you want to be, who you are to be with all the traumas and pain that you've carried? Mm -hmm. um, are you still able to give yourself to us through your work? Well, last year, okay, no, two years ago, when I lost my mom, I started writing again. I do have this thing of taking three to five year breaks in between albums because I don't just go and write one song and then go and perform and do other things and then go like write another song. When I get into studio, I'm in there 
until the whole album is done. And that's usually at least 18 hour days in studio every single day. So it's quite uh, heavy, it's, a, it's, it's, it's very heavy. Um, and what usually happens is that something drives me to go and take out, you know, maybe I feel like I'm, I'm about to explode or something like that, you know. It's, there's usually a big event that drives me to studio to write. So um, two years ago when my mom passed, um, I was driven to the studio and I wrote quite a few songs. Um, which we did live. Um, it's called Moya, the Moya, mm -hmm, the Moya project. It will be released sometime this year. We're just finalizing on some paperwork I'm and stuff to like that. Um, yes. I've never stopped grieving the loss of my mother, and I know in your words and in your music I'll find even more healing. What do you want us to remember you as? Uh, you know, you speak about how you might leave us, uh, you straddle, but you might leave to conquer other worlds with your music. You're a jaded South African. Um, what must we remember? If, as I walk away from this, what do you want me to remember about you? I'll always be around. Like My music will always be around. Um, but what I do, I, I, I think I did mention this in another interview, is that I want to be remembered as someone who left the world a much better place than how they found it. Um, I'm hoping that my efforts to make life better through my music um, will continue having an impact on people's lives and changing people's lives. Uh, because um, I don't do my music for entertainment. I do my music for healing. And it starts with my own healing, you know, and, and that's how um, it can resonate because it comes from a very honest place. So I'm hoping that on a spiritual level, that's how I would like to be remembered. May you will be done. That's Thank you. Done. Thank you so much. That's it from us. Uh, we'll be back again next week.